Welcome again. This is our third and final of the Knowledge Foundation webinars. We'll be talking about tomorrow's program, which is day zero, which is also a webinar, but it's got a slightly different take to it. We're going to have uh, Ario and Punya talk about that toward the end of today's program. Uh, my name's Larry Reagan. I'm, I'm just uh, pleased to be here as your moderator today. And on behalf of Ario Ambar and Punya Mishra from Arizona State and our entire leadership team, we say welcome. So um, just a reminder, if you wanted to see the brief video, we have an introductory video on the website, this, the uh, stem-futures.org website, if you'd like to preview sort of the, the overview of the project. Uh, as was asked in the second webinar, I'll just go over some brief objectives for today's program. We're hoping to establish a shared understanding of these uh, knowledge domains, not so much sort of uh, by title and description, more sort of in the concept phase. As you know, today's is going to be around foundational knowledge. Uh, we also hope to be able to use that structure as we move forward in the project. So you have a reference point, an anchor point, if you will. Um, and then we'd also like to be able to contextualize the, the entire uh, project, the workshop that's going to be coming up in two weeks. So you, you have a good idea of how we're going to be moving forward in that. So a few housekeeping details. Uh, as we've done before, please feel free to use the chat as a way to dialogue, interact. Um, we've gotten uh, URLs posted, great ideas posted. Punya will be our channeler for the chat box. And as he th sees things coming up, he may encourage you to post those over to the question and answer device, which Ariel will be managing for us. And as questions come up, uh, we'll engage him as well. Just a reminder, the way we did it last, the last two times has been to have a dialogue with our guests, <clears throat> excuse me, of about 35, 40 minutes. And then we really want to open it up for uh, that interaction with you, the conversation with our participants. So as you have a scratch pad or a digital device, take a note, write down your idea. You might post it in the chat and have other people respond and, and reflect on that as well. Um, aside from that, uh, Thomas has made a PowerPoint available to us and it is available as well on the stem.futures.org uh, website. And that is under the knowledge uh, webinar, which is today's program. It's at the very bottom there. I've, I've gone through it. It's pretty spectacular, a little intimidating, uh, in particular when you look at the number of different projects going on in different parts of, of space. It's, it's amazing. Uh, so I welcome you to take a look at that. <clears throat> I think that'll help to um, understand a little bit of Thomas's orientation as well. So just a, a very quick recap. Uh, last Tuesday, we launched with Richard Pitt and Katina Michaels. We were talking about humanistic knowledge, a little bit around identity, around inclusion. And Katina in particular was talking about the implications of the technology and human interaction. Thursday, we shifted a bit. We were talking then about meta-knowledge, that is, how do we know what we know? Candace Thiel and Elkie Weber were our uh, experts that day, and they were talking about uh, the study of cognition and, and in particular, technology and learning and Elke's uh, work around risk assessment and decision making, which was, which was fascinating. Today, we're honored to have two prominent scholars with us. Uh, and what I love about this setup is we have the educational domain represented and we have the scientific applied side, if you will, with NASA. Uh, Thomas Zerbuchen is the Associate Administrator for NASA's mission, science mission. Um, I practice this word. I can't tell you how many times I practice. Uh, dictorate. Dictor Directorate. Directorate. D Directorate. Thank you. So sorry about that. <laughs> and okay. Susan Singer. Much easier to pronounce her role. Uh, Susan is the Vice President in, uh, for Academic Affairs and Provost at Rollins College. So welcome to both of you, we're anxious to hear your perspectives and your views on this topic. Uh, we've got some big questions to deal with today and we're really hoping to, uh, to have you help us understand your, your lens. So if it's okay, we, as we've done in the past, we'd like to ask each of you to share a little bit of your context with us, you know, three to five minutes of your view of the world and some of the research you've worked on and 
Susan, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Thank you so much for the chance to be with everybody. I'm so excited about the work ahead for the group. So I have long been deeply immersed in both higher education research and my disciplinary work. Um, I'm a plant developmental biologist and do genomics. And I think what may be relevant for you in terms of experiences I can offer has been I was one of the founding members of the Board on Science Education out of the National Academies and now chair that board. And that's been a board that's really lifted up and pulled together the research on what we know about how people learn. That's also the board that um, developed the framework on the K-12, the next generation um, framework for K-12 science standards. And I think there's some very instructive pieces in there about how we might think together about linking the what you've talked about in the last two sessions and the foundational knowledge in the disciplines today. Um, I had the privilege of serving as the director of the Division of Undergraduate Education at NSF and coordinating the undergrad objectives of the first federal STEM education strategic plan. And I'm particularly thrilled to interact with Thomas in this webinar today because beyond thinking about how the work in industry informs how we prepare the next generation, thinking about the work of the mission agencies is really paramount and something that's not part of our everyday conversation out in the academy, so super important. He was involved in vision and change in undergraduate biology and served as a senior editor and I'm on the board of course source, um, which developed, again, guided by this overall work about core foundational knowledge in biology, as well as on the lab redesign for the AP framework, which really rethought how we teach the equivalent in some ways of introductory biology at the college level to high school students. So part of a, a broad swath of efforts to understand how we prepare future biologists. And my current research looks at all different sectors within higher education and driving change there. And that just keeps me attentive to the distinct nature of different aspects of higher education and the needs and the outcomes. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of the great conversation. Thank you, Susan. Uh, one of the things I'd love to hear from you in a bit is uh, around your thoughts of the skill sets and the competencies that students coming out of higher ed will need to enter the workforce and in the workplace. So uh, thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure. Uh, Thomas, would you share with us a little bit of your background and your, in particular, your interest and in, uh, creativity, imagination, the stuff that, that uh, gets you excited? Yeah. So. You know, as the head of science at NASA, uh, we have a portfolio of 105 or so missions. Uh, you saw that on one of those charts, if you looked at it. Uh, looking both at our beautiful planet, uh, other worlds like the planets uh, around us, uh, but also all the way into the deep universe. And for me, you know, it's always important to ask why. Uh, why are you excited about this? Why do you do this? And, and for me, it's actually a very childlike sense that got me there. Uh, the feeling that you have under the sky at night is the feeling I have every day doing this work, which is uh, basically learning about something that's incredibly beautiful uh, with a sense of awe and excitement, uh, but also uh, recognizing that we can build tools to explore that. When we explore that, we also learn about ourselves and do so in a way that is frankly just amazing uh, from the perspective of the activity itself. Uh, we can see one of those spacecraft uh, after thousands of individuals bringing their very best to it, go into the sky and do this amazing work. But also, of course, magnificent from the point of view what we're learning. Every one of those missions is full of surprises and teaches us more about nature itself. And I thought the, uh, uh, the, the one thing I could do, uh, Rick, and if that's okay with you, is just to quickly tell you a story. It kind of talks a little bit about how I link 
uh, to education. If you looked at my resume, so of course I was a professor for a while. I want to talk about John. And uh, frankly, if you looked at uh, the slides that were there, you could go look at uh, pictures uh, of her. And, and so let me just tell you, I met Joan, and there's really three acts in this uh, story. And I met Joan in my classroom. I was a professor at the University of Michigan, and I uh, was, was running a capstone experience. And Joan came in and, uh, and uh, basically recognized, of course, she's smart as doing. She was a soccer player, very much engaged, was coaching. Uh, and, you know, I noticed pretty quickly how strong she was, um, uh, both technically, uh, looking at the depth of the kind of stuff we were doing in aerospace engineering and systems engineering, but also how strong she was as a leader. And frankly, I remember the discussion I had in my office uh, where we talked about the Capstone project, which in this case was actually working with Google and putting out ground stations into Africa and connecting schools to the internet in a way they were never connected. And I asked her, who do you think is the best leader in a group and of all the class? Uh, and she said, uh, you know, she started talking about her colleagues. And it's like, let me tell you who I think is the best leader, you. Mm. And so I'd like to coach you to be a leader. Uh, she was incredibly successful doing that. So that's act one. She went and worked at JPL. And of course, like many of the students I worked with, whenever I travel, I actually put on social media where I am and I go hang out in some watering hole. And I meet those students again because I get so much energy and excitement from them. And there she was showing up in Pasadena and she looked incredibly tired. Uh, what had happened is she is the integrations uh, system engineer of, of an instrument on Mars 2020, uh, uh, a spacecraft that we launched to Mars uh, on uh, July 30th this year. And something horrible had happened. Mm -hmm. What had happened is one of the electronics boards uh, uh, had a failure on it, a part, a piece part that we bought and you know they bought and tested multiple times. All of a sudden, in one of the boards had broken and the kind of acid on the inside was spilling over the board. Well, what happened is, is Joan and her team had to work over time. And of course, the in-depth knowledge that she had from the many classes, many of which were not my classes, uh, were uh, in fact, uh, you know, coming to her aid, specialists around the table, one of the, the slides, you see people that the group of uh, experts there at 3 a.m. Uh, working through a problem as they had replaced that board and were testing it. So that is uh, kind of act number two. And act number three was at launch. Uh, you know, we, despite COVID and everything, we uh, were getting ready to launch. And that was, uh, you know, just a, a story for another time. But I noticed on social media that she and her family were actually in Florida. She wanted to show her family that launch. And of course, uh, she, well, you know, we had massively reduced the attendance. So what I did is I promoted her. Uh, as I told her, it's really important to choose your professors the right way. So you can go, you know, and go to VVIP launches, uh, you know, a few, you know, a decade later or so. And so, so basically I promoted her into that uh, VVIP place. You see a picture of us there. And, uh, and I asked her, you know, so for, I saw her, as I saw, as I said, kind of in classroom, I saw her in the middle of a crisis and I saw her there and I saw that pride of the family, uh, which she cannot, I mean, for me, that was worth everything. Uh, but when I asked her, I actually uh, asked her and my team, it's like, you know, so how did in fact the education that you got affect the work that you did? Just really, you performed a miracle together with your team. And uh, I'm gonna read to you and I'll stop with that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Larry, I'll stop with that. Uh, Basically, um, uh, what she said is once you're in a workplace, success is not wholly dependent on how well you solve equations and model the physics. I have found that success in real world problem solving is dependent on being able to make decisions by weighing the risk of success, as well as performing under high pressure and stress situations. And she had a lot of those, let me tell you. Uh, these uh, high pressure and risk situations can be caused by lack of information time schedule, different opinions, challenging personalities. We all know that, right? And I'm grateful for the experience. My professors uh, gave me at college that forced me to experience challenges similar to that. There's a few dots there. What I cut out is in part the experience she had with that project in which she learned how to actually do that in uh, the classroom. These high intensity experiences, as she refers to it, uh, from college taught me that I could do more than I ever knew I could 
it opened up that door, uh, another kind of uh, door of awe, right? Kind of you see what you can, uh, you know, you find these other gears that you have. You, you're driving around in the first and the second gear, but there's five more. You just didn't know they were there. But they gave me soft skills that I use every day to work and lead and collaborate with others and introduce me to non-technical aspects of decision-making, risk assessment and stress management. So that, for me, that story kind of reacts really kind of explains just with one story kind of how I think about education and the relationship to what I do now. And, and, and what a what a great story. I love, Thomas, the spirit that you bring to the to the story as well about connecting with a student and then going over time. But, but I have to tell you, it segues perfectly into this first question. Susan, I'd like your thoughts on this as well. Um, so there's some debate a little, I guess, around the term foundational knowledge. You know, is it the, is it the nights and bolts, as, as your student uh, referenced there? Is it the formulas? Is it the stuff that we need to know that makes us successful? Or is it, is it the process? Is it the discipline, the training that one goes through in a scientific method, a scientific manner in order to solve these problems? And, and um or is it some combination? And I guess I'm a little curious, have you seen that shift or change of the balance, if there's a balance there, has that changed at all over time? Thomas, if I could start with you, and then Susan, I'd like to love to get your response to that as well. I'm really interested in what is, Susan is gonna say. Of course she is okay. a scholarly <laughs> orientation, much more equipped to answer that. My personal feeling has been that it has changed and it necessarily had to change. And the simple reason for that is frankly, the way I think of it through the eyes of a technologist, right? Mm -hmm. You can't possibly learn the kind of know-how of any one kind of wave of technology that, that sweeps over you. Uh, and the speed at which these waves come, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the internet, uh, whether it's kind of the, the so, you know, high-end computing, AI, machine learning, whatever, they affect all of us. You can't possibly learn all of these in a way that we used to learn, you know, uh, kind of in, in early days, certain things, we check off a box. We know how to solve a, you know, second order, ordinary differential equation, you know, that's how we do it, right? So we can't possibly learn it that way. So these other behaviors, how you go at a problem and also how you learn uh, I think, and, and, and learning kind of your own orientation, like me personally, like, yes, there's certain techniques, what works for me? I just think it's one of the most essential things to bring with you uh, once you walk off that graduation podium. Mm. Susan. Good, good point. Susan. Uh, Larry, my, my response is all three of the things you mentioned are inextricably interwoven, and I'm going to talk about this in, in three parts, briefly, each of the three parts. But um, one, Joan's story, Thomas, resonates, right? One of the pieces of my work right now is I'm coordinating the entire COVID mitigation and response effort for my entire university. And I am so grateful for my engineering and science background, which enables me to competently and confidently manage this. And you don't know when you're going to get to use that, right? As, as Joan found out. Um, I, let me ease into this with the other two parts. The first is that, especially from the life sciences, but it, this is true for all the sciences, we're seeing this happen. And it happened concurrently in both K-12 and the undergrad levels, first with thinking about core competencies in the science, cross-cutting competencies, and talking about the practices, right, in both engineering and in science. And that's the foundation of the framework for the next generation science standards that informed the science standards that you know you can go and look for on the web that achieve developed and at the same time the ap folks redid the approach to advanced placement teaching and in biology if you look at the four to five core areas that these different projects i'm going to mention independently arrived at they're all the same. They all intersect. Maybe you take one big idea and break it down 
a little. And we saw the same thing then happen when the undergrad biologists got together over what has ended up being over a 10 year period in developing vision and change in undergrad biology. And then course source trying to implement this with modules again adapted that same framework within all the different disciplinary fields within biology that represent the 200 level courses. So we think about this as being a hard task and yet we have evidence over and over that when groups come together, they settle on the core big ideas and then they can break them down and still show significant restraint, which for biologists is incredible, right? I'm an author of a 1200 page intro bio textbook and it's market driven and everybody wants every favorite thing in there. And I, I know from years of teaching in a department that was committed to not doing that, that it's possible that everybody can teach their favorite thing related to the same core concept, but use it, whether I use a plan example or a colleague talks about zebra fish, there's ways to do it if you become conceptual. So I think if biologists can do it, all the sciences can, because we were the, other than evolution, we were really, really detailed folks. And then let's back it up one more step. And that's why I think those first two workshops you've all been working on our webinars are, are particularly valuable. Part of the reason I came to Rollins was this opportunity to link um, what some people call general education, we call it foundations of liberal learning and the major and all the other experiences because you don't spend all that much time in your undergraduate you're sitting in a classroom you're out learning whether you're leading the lacrosse team or you're doing community engagement or you're working on social entrepreneurship so i think the american association of colleges and universities have given us an excellent frame with the leap initiative for core competencies from teamwork to critical thinking to problem solving. We've baked those into our foundations of the liberal arts. We've done it in a way that's sequential. It's developmental. It ends in a capstone course. It's not just check off the box. I took a humanities course. I took a social science course. I took a science course. And it's uplifting what those foundational skills can be. The next step is that the major and these foundational skills need to be aligned and integrated. They're not separate parts of your experience. So I would steer you towards National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenge Scholars Program, which is really built on these, these skills beyond knowing your discipline, but deeply tied to your discipline. And I'm at a school that doesn't offer a four-year engineering degree, and we're the first non-engineering liberal arts college to be a Grand Challenge Scholars program because of our foundational learning. So put the pieces together and then start thinking beyond that, beyond internships, beyond research, what does this look like? You know, again, back to Thomas's story about Joan, if you start to understand how these skills play out in the real world, let's make our campuses more porous. Susan, you, you gave me a, a lot to work with there. I, I, I just wanted to- Sorry. That, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was marvelous. But what it got me thinking was about this issue of, because you spoke of the soft skills, you spoke of the the problem solving and the ability to work in teams and so forth. And Thomas mentioned one that was interesting to me to hear him say, uh, and that was leadership. And so I, I got to thinking, how do we build curriculum? How do we build um, a, a four year experience for students where we gather, where, where we, we train them up in, in those soft skills? I know soft skills is a a word that not everybody loves, but it kind of defines what we're talking about. Plus, so this is where I'm thinking back to our earlier conversations, there are knowledge domains in the humanities and, and covered in the, the social sciences and so forth that we'd also like to have, right, brought forward and in this. And there, so it's not just a matter of being cross-disciplinary, it's also a matter of being, uh, of, of giving students experiences in the practice 
of some of these things. You, t you mentioned the, the teamwork and all. That's about perspective. Absolutely agree. And so, so let me brief to one, I feel really strongly that it does a disservice to civil society for scientists to treat the humanities and social science courses as liberal arts courses that are going to help you develop you know, the necessarily soft skills, which are a heck of a lot harder to develop than in many ways, a lot of the disciplinary skills. So I really want us to think about this as a partnership and the National Academy study on two branches of the same tree, quoting Einstein, is a particularly salient document. I think you have to bake it into the entire program, right? So we have a Center for Leadership and Community engagement. We bake community engagement into courses. Students take courses with CE designations, but we have a program called Rollins Gateway where we help students from day one tell their personal narrative. So helping them articulate that, wow, I, you know, had a leadership role in my sorority and I developed leadership skills that are going to be valuable in this context or I led this amazing um, the UN Millennium Fellows we have a group of that um, and entrepreneurial innovation related to one of the 17 sustainable development goals of the UN in our community and I developed skills with community building, with partnership, and I understand how to do that in a way that it's going to be relevant in this job, right? That ability to transfer, that only happens if you're, you think very differently about what higher ed infrastructure is. It needs to be people, programs, and thinking about place in a much broader way. Yes, the digital piece because of COVID, for a broader way to porous walls to your campus. And it only works if there are multiple mentors throughout campus, not just your academic advisor, asking you to think about how you put these stories together, how you tell the narrative of your, whether it's two years or four years, or if it takes you seven years mm -hmm. to go through your education, how the pieces fit together. Because an employer can't do that for you, a grad school admissions team can't, you need to do it. And you need to understand it, right? You need to be metacognitive about that so that when you are out there in the world, you're actually pulling on those experiences and we can all be Joan. I, uh, do you mind if I just add a comment to that? No, there? please do. With that. So I just wanted to just, um, you know, echo uh, what Susan just said and amplify it. Uh, and I'm going to turn again up in a negative statement. My biggest concern of some of the trajectories of engineering disciplines have been that they have given up on the breadth of the liberal arts education in, in many cases. And that is not helping the students, I would argue. Mm. Uh, we want, you know, students that come work with us to have an understanding of the context of, of history, uh, the context of uh, other cultural and identities and so forth. And, and of course, uh, many uh, disciplines do that really well, but there is a temptation that uh, you go into, you know, you have the faculty meeting, we've all been in it, right, in which there's a discussion yet again uh, to take three electives and make them something that three faculty care about in that room, right, an elective that uh, was stance or it was, you know, uh, had to do with Kind of open up uh, the horizon of that particular scope of the body of students to kind of go look at uh, something that's broader and really equips them uh, down down uh, stream. I, I just really, I, for me, it's like I, kind of in academia. I think uh, you know, and, and I'm going to look at that through the lens of uh, engineering colleges, where I spend much of my time. Right, I really believe that's something that's essential. I would actually argue. But some of the disconnects we're observing in the world uh, could in part be traced to that disconnect that we're starting to have people walk away from each other, not speaking each other's language and communication is such an important part of it, right? Kind of, I mean, you have to be able with different backgrounds to come together and, and figure out where your respective positions are. If you don't even speak the same language, how do you, 
how do you do that, right? So, so it's, I mean, for me, I, you know, having run kind of um, innovation entrepreneurial programs, I spend a lot of effort campus wide on bringing people together, speaking kind of an innovation language, a business language. It's not because business is the most important thing, but if you mix up marketing and sales, you know, you never, you know, you know, I mean, you will not understand what this discussion is about, even if it's a non-for-profit, by the way, a social entrepreneurship venture in which, frankly, money is an enabler. It's not an outcome, right? It's, it's you know, so so for us, uh, for me, that that is uh, really something uh, that I care about deeply. And I, I, I encounter in my world, you know, in various places where, where that kind of lack of uh, kind of education really uh, is materializing. Can I just underscore what Thomas said? As, as an undergrad engineer, my favorite course was a sophomore course called Existential Pleasures of Engineering. And just super important. I, I did want to acknowledge that I think there's opportunity out there, right? When I was at NSF, we funded work that actually MIT was the lead on in developing a liberal arts of engineering curriculum recognizing that, like I, I've spent most of my career, I was at Carleton College before Rollins, where we have robust 3-2 engineering programs where you get the liberal learning, but you know, how many seniors want to give up senior year with their students and go someplace else, right? We have students that go to Columbia and WashU, but they're small numbers. And so is there a way to bake that into the traditional engineering programs and fewer and fewer engineering jobs require a professional engineering certification, which has you know, been a driver for a lot of students not to look more broadly. And then I think ABET, right? They got out in front of so many of the other accrediting groups with broadening what they expect from the students, right? The ethics, the teamwork mm -hmm. elements, it's an opportunity, but again, with accreditation, it's only an opportunity. It's what the institutions make of it. So again, I'm a big fan of the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenge Scholars Program because they are deliberately and intentionally doing that. Thomas, they have entrepreneurship in there because, you know, like my college, right, I work with the business colleagues all the time. It's a very different language. It's a very different way of presenting and interacting. And if you don't have some experience with that, you're just going to go, that person's way different than me. I'm not going there. So really important point, Thomas. And I think there are opportunities. Thank you. And, and to both of your points, we, we can no longer afford to have students trained in these silos of a single mentality and not understanding the need for diverse thought and perspective and so forth. And I would imagine in both of your cases, you see examples of of, of this playing out. Uh, Angela asks a question that's been on my mind for both of you as well, and it has to do with that issue of leadership. What, what techniques or methods or, or programs can we conceptualize as a student goes through a four-year program that, that helps establish students' understanding of what leadership means and perhaps gives them opportunities to experience and to practice that particular skill set. So, so it's not an add-on. It's not something I do external to my coursework, but it's something I'm given the opportunity within my coursework. So uh, I'm, again, interested in what Susan uh, says about this, but uh, for me, I actually think, you know, teamwork and especially kind of the, the work that kind of around capstone and other kind of class related uh, or uh, kind of uh, kind of you know project work are a huge opportunity to actually think about uh, uh, all the elements of leadership uh, how you set a goal um, mm. how, to, how to to get and motivate a team to achieve that how to come through disappointments how to deal with include kind of uh, the diversity within the group as a strength and not stifle it, right? How, how, you, uh, how you come in at the other end, of, again, come back from disappointments. Uh, I mean, I've made the point before, I'll make it again. You know, my, my biggest worry in many of the schools that are, you know, the good faculty are, are uh, calling in from, right? And many people are like, oh, our median GPA of everybody that is a, admitted as 
And you know, the, the way I always think about this, I'm the first to graduate uh, in my family from college, right? Uh, let me just tell you, my GPA was not 3.9. Mm. Uh, by the way, most uh, first who graduate, you know, first uh, in their families, their GPA is not 3.9. Why? Because they're going to fail from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, I've actually saw, thought that was a huge strength I had because I was far less scared of failure than so many of the people who had never had a grade below an A. And, and the B plus was kind of the biggest disaster they ever faced, right? So, so for me, on a scholarly side, and so for me, you know, how coming back from disappointment creating that emotional resilience to uh, recognize that failure is not the opposite of success, but part of success it is, is also part of leadership for me. And so I do think, so by the way, you see the background, my dog is going in and out and then you hear the basis in the background. So I apologize, uh, Luna is her name, by the way. You have, you have a, a lively household, looks right. great. So, so, so for me, I, I do believe there's ample opportunity. I just want to tell you the way I did it uh, which may not be scalable, but I actually asked, I, was, I did, of course, teach in a campus with a strong psych department. And I actually co-taught a number of these experiential classes with uh, uh, fellow psychologists that actually uh, worked together with me to really make sure that we, that we again, we included the social sciences into the, into the science and engineering classroom. We didn't accidentally do that. We actually were deliberate about that. Uh, for example, we would, uh, uh, in, in many of the class projects, actually drive towards a point of stress deliberately and tell them that's what we're doing and have them observe each other and as a team under that uh, point. But Susan, I'm really interested in your answer to this. Yeah, so two pieces to my answer. One, I just want to echo the fail forward fast idea you know, and I will confess, Thomas, it took me a little longer to learn that because I was that, you know, perfectionist, please everybody, never got anything less than an A in your life. And that, that was not a helpful experience, right? It, um, it, you know, it's the other kinds of resiliency and all that you need. So how do we create that opportunity? So the first point is, we have to model that. And one of the things I've fallen in love with at the institution I'm at now is that there is a culture amongst faculty that if you're not failing every once in a while, you're not innovating and you're not improving in the classroom. And that actually gets called out in tenure and promotion reviews that you expect people to have some things that didn't work and you expect them to be reflective and responsive, not keep running into the same brick wall all the time. That's a different scenario. Why do I think that's important? Because the students need to see people that they respect are willing to take risks mm -hmm. and are willing to say, hey, we tried that. That didn't work so well. That's on me and here's the way forward. So I think that's incredibly important. And I think the second thing, whether it's students or faculty, that we need to work on is an understanding of what leadership is. And again, Thomas really gave a very fine definition. But every single one of us, most of our leading is done from within. It's done by leading through influence. Um, and even if you have, you know, what's perceived as positional hierarchy and leadership, invoking that never brings about the kind of lasting change that you seek. And so I think it's really important early on, which is great with, you know, students come to college from high school where they've had really crappy experiences sometimes with team learning because they were the bright kid and they felt like they ended up doing the work for everybody else and they really don't want to give that a try at college and risk their GPA. Really working hard, it's starting with teamwork. There's a lot of good research out of the NIH, out of um, the National Academy. There's a report on the science of team science. Using that to work with students, knowing that assessments of teamwork only work at the level of a team. You can't go in and assess an individual all by himself or herself. For team ability, there's a report out of the academies called Supporting Students' Success 
in college that looks at broad scale assessments for these other intra and interpersonal skills, which I, I prefer that language or socio emotional domain rather than soft skills, mm -hmm. how we can assess that. But think about leadership that way. I had a student the other day come to talk to me about how, you know, he wants to be a college president. And so can he get to be one by 30? <laughs> <laughs> You know, so we had a very deep conversation about how, you know, he can really think about his leadership experience. And I bet he will be, and he'll be phenomenal, right? And I admire his clear sense of where he wants to go. But we think about leading as, you know, we are going to be up there orchestrating like a conductor in an orchestra, and everybody's going to do what we want. And isn't that going to be awesome? And that's not leadership. Right, right. You know, it, it, uh, I just had this crazy idea. Maybe what we need is a class called Failure 101, you know, where we, where we go through that, that experience of failure. I, I think it's... Resiliency. Yes, it's more resiliency. Yeah, there you go. I like that. I like that, Susan. Resiliency 101. Um, Ario, I know you have a couple questions there in the Q&A. Q, Q Would you want to share one with us? Yeah, sure. There, there's a couple that are on the same themes. I'm, I'm going to consolidate them by uh, Jim, Swar Jim Schwartz and uh, Jason Williams. Um, uh, so given that, you know, those of us who've been around the block a little bit have, have heard these kind of things before, right? There are many high-level reports that have recommended uh, similar things about the need to focus more on essential skills, vital skills, as opposed to so-called foundational content. Um, so, so why is it that we've seen so little change? Mm. Right. Why does academia, why does the system seems to be so resistant to, to changing? What are the barriers and what can that tell us about how we might actually address that in the work that we're going to be doing in terms of designing STEM programs? Um, and how are the way, what, what are the, what advice would you have for institutionalizing change um, while overcoming these kind of, kind of resistance? Either one of you. Uh, I'll first. jump in because I, I, again, I, <laughs> I, I actually have evidence, not just an opinion. I do have a lot of opinions, but I, again, would encourage people to think about how you build from your general education to the major. And many institutions across the country right now are engaged in general education reform. It's not just an idea I have off here in a corner by myself. It's happening pretty broadly across higher ed. And if we could rethink that, and again, not just what we hope to accomplish, not just what the learning outcomes are, but how we assess them. And again, I, you know, I'm, I'm not pushing the, the LEAP rubrics, but we have found those to be very helpful at our institution and we assess different um, of these set of skills at two points throughout the general education, which is designed to be developmental so we can see if students are progressing. Every department needs to contribute in some way to the general education. It's taught as entirely integrated. So each experience, the students are learning how to work across disciplinary borders. And where we, I believe we need to go, and I think this is where if you're looking at your disciplinary domain, you can think about what kind of partnerships, intellectual partnerships at least, can we have with our general education? As students move through that, what are the time points? How does that align with our curricular goals for our students? And how do we build upon what they've already done? So we're not over here doing something that you know, they actually got pretty good at critical thinking in general education. Well, let's use that aligned with the disciplinary outcome. And what we have to do is use very explicit language about the translation, right? We all know that's one of, you know, the holy grail in higher ed is how to translate. I learned about energy and biology, but then I took chemistry and physics. And that, that's like chemistry energy and physics energy and, and the idea that it's the same thing you know, it's, it's still a puzzle to many students. So thinking about skills, naming the skills that you've acquired, that's something we haven't practiced at all. But I think we could, let's leverage, let someone else do some of the work for us. Let's not shove everything into the major. Let's think about the holistic experience. So, so if I can just pick up on that and direct this towards Thomas, so, so uh, and pick up a question from the chat, a comment from the chat. So uh, Lizette Torres -Ger Gerald points out that, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to create rubrics, assessments, 
plans, getting folks to actually act on these is, is a big challenge. And I'm wondering, Thomas, is there a role for entities from outside the academy, and NASA being an example, right? Employers, big companies, uh, to play in sort of helping to get institutions, faculty and administrators really over the activation barrier from design to implementation. And what I'm thinking about is I, you know, I, I've heard you talk before, right? Here you are as the head of the science activities of one of the largest science driven agencies on the planet doing very expensive complex missions. And you speak eloquently, right, about the need for things beyond simple subject content knowledge, right? You've, you've done it here. So it seems to me that's a powerful message coming from outside of academia. This is what we need you to do, right? This is what we want to pay your students. These are skills we need to, we need if we're going to pay your students in the future to go into NASA or, uh, you know, Amazon or wherever, right? So is there a role to play there? And, and, and take, a, take this question wherever you want, but that's what runs through my mind when I hear Susan and I see Lisette's comment and turn to you. So I've tried very hard to, you know, as part of what I do, right, kind of system engineering is what we're doing really at NASA, right, kind of many of us, you know, there's specialists that do many things, but we pull it all together and, and there's a number of problems we can't solve within any grant or any contract and some of the ones that you're mentioning are there and I've, I've engaged with uh, numerous universities uh, on on discussions like that at high level. I also have, you know, frankly, every time I visit with a university, whether it's, you know, Arizona State or any other ones, right? I try to, I actually ask specifically to meet with early career faculty because I think uh, ultimately, you know, progress comes from uh, kind of a generation. I mean, there's many of us can change as we go forward and we don't want to say that that's not possible, but, but I think, you know, uh, uh, change also can come from new opinions that enter the room, right? And so for me, one of the reasons I did that, I, I would be very interested uh, from, you know, as you go forward with this activity, uh, if you had specific things that we could do better in that respect. I mean, we care about it deeply. I have absolutely no problem kind of being even more vocal. And frankly, I don't know how I could be more vocal about it. Um, I do recognize, I uh, just want to say, kind of having worked in multiple bureaucracies, I just want to say with all due respect, universities are just that, right? They're, they're built for stability. Uh, they're uh, organizations that have tremendous value and have often, you know, the, the, they're very good. They may even be excellent, uh, but uh, so often, you know, that, that is in the way of change, right? Because what you really have to do, right, kind of change is, is so hard because you have to give up something. You have to move from where you are that looks comfortable to you, kind of the, uh, the planning that you have used, the structures that you've used to a place that is far less defined, you know. And so often in academia, what, what is being used kind of as a standard of perfection, right? So see, perfection and innovation don't usually live in the same space, uh, certainly not at the beginning, Right, and so, so, for, so, so for me, I think there are models that universities and or different academic units have used. Uh, Susan spoke well about things that she has done, right? I've seen kind of cross-cutting platform programs that universities have built up that kind of allow students to opt in and kind of move those and bring the faculty along. The goal is not to take the student away from the faculty, but for faculty to opt in and then use that to go back into the color curricular piece. By the way, I'm using similar techniques at NASA in change, right? Kind of, I, have, I do have silos, uh, earth science, heliophysics, uh, you know, so, and so, so, so how do we learn from each other and, and kind of bring those forwards? I think those are, you know, that's where, uh, you know, academic leaders uh, or, or earn their tremendous value for the for the organization as a whole to really open up the door for that. But uh, make no mistake, it takes initiative, and it's and it, it's just like any one of those entrepreneurial or innovative endeavors. It can be pretty frustrating, and I have you know I've lived that life right in academia too. I've built classes over and above what I'm supposed to do because I thought it was right. And yes, that did not help me with tenure and that did not help me with the annual evaluation. Uh, that, you know, that's, I mean, I, we all have those struggles, right? Kind of that, that uh, we work with. It's important. Uh, Ariel, I'd, I'd like to learn how I could be more effective in that communication because uh, frankly, the companies that I talk to, right? I mean, for what it's worth, 
uh, one of my jobs is I talk to all kind of high uh, level companies that are in our space that they're mostly, you know, the Lockheed Martins, the Boeings, the whatever, you know, and the, the ball aerospace and, and, you know, companies that are smaller also. And those are the discussions we're having is the, the necessity of having, of course, some of the technical depth, right? I mean, just want to make sure that we're not discarding that, right? You know, uh, we want, uh, you know, to have, a, a, again, the common kind of uh, platform to kind of, you know, to connect with, but then also having the other pieces, which are, uh, in many cases, much more relevant for success or failure for a given project, but also for a career kind of potential. And I think, Thomas, you know, we might look to our community colleges for some models that we could delve into and adapt. So the National Science Foundation, for it's going on 27 years, has funded the Advanced Technological Education Program. And actually, this is a whole group of um, national networks that are part of a research project I'm working on. So I spend a lot of time with them. And they have all, in order to even get funding, they have to have a robust relationship with a specific industry. And it's high tech technical skills. It's technician, but it's, you know, if you're going to do welding, it's welding with composite materials. It's thinking about very advanced mechatronics or photonics. And they work with built business industry leadership teams. They meet, many meet quarterly where the industry looks at, you know, what are the key performance indicators, but they respect that the educators know how to help get to that point. They don't tell people how to teach. They go back and forth. And the builds that I've listened in on, they have all of those additional practical skills, team skills, communication, built in as high priorities. I think we could learn a lot from that. And I think especially at the four-year level and the graduate level, there have been some things through the graduate education programs at NSF that really support more work with industry. But we've not gotten very good at figuring out how you have a meaningful partnership. The engineering directorate at NSF has the industry university partnerships, the engineering research centers also, which push on that, the um, advanced manufacturing, huge center set up um, during the Obama administration. It's part of them, I think they're called now America Makes, uh, or no, that's one of them, it's uh, Manufacturing USA, are examples of, you know, people really trying to do that. And that that's a conceptual shift for everybody. Somehow we have, I keep talking about campuses needing to be porous, we seem to, you know, need to protect this intellectual rigor. And I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both end and we're not going to sell out and be training people, but we darn well ought to pay attention to what's going to help our students be successful and with the expertise we have help them get there. So if, if it's okay, I'd like to go back to a question that was posted on the chat, which I think relates to and kind of ties these things together. Um, Gustavo mentions the idea that, uh, you know, a lot of, not only just STEM education, but a lot of education is a very factory oriented, historically grounded traditional system. And we built this system and man, it is tough to break out of these uh, mindsets. I wanted to mention, Susan and Thomas, that one of the criteria for our team projects down the road is going to be around the implementation of the strategies that might be used to implement what we're hoping are going to be some radical ideas about how to change things up. And I'm wondering from both of your perspectives, if you have ideas, uh, Susan is a senior leader at your institution, Thomas is a senior leader in your organization, how do we create some organizational change? What are the implementation strategies we might use or think about in order to get some of these ideas advanced? Thomas, can I start with you? Yeah, I'm trying to, kind of my mind is racing, right? Um, well, 
if you want, there, there's there's a, a little further chat going that's gone on that resonates with this that might be worth riffing off of. Also, Melissa and Laura have been going back and forth around quantitative measures, mm -hmm. right? That we tend to obsess over quantitative measures, which I think resonates with this whole factory model, right? It's a, it's you know controlled inputs, controlled outputs. What can you measure, quantify about student learning? And and the issue being that there's many things that these quantitative measures miss, right? And, and maybe that's part of the solution here. I agree. I agree. And, you know, just because you can measure it doesn't make it important. Uh, you want to measure where you can, that's useful, right? You know, generally speaking, that's a good uh, principle. But, but again, uh, uh, both, uh, both sides of that uh, uh, matter. Look, I mean, for me, uh, in terms of uh, trick, right, I'm a strong believer that innovation comes from small, diverse teams, right? So for me, uh, what I try to do in, in our organization, whenever I really we think we're stuck somewhere. What I, what I try to do is deliberately uh, kind of uh, search, uh, look for ways to bring small teams together that, uh, that come up with uh, new ideas. And frankly, they're asked to, you know, fully, I mean, they've come up with new ideas and, and, and drive and kind of get supported. Kind of, uh, as a leader, I shelter those, right? Kind of those ideas to really go forward. And, and, and we're, Kind of one of the things that I'm really passionate about is actually to do it, to play through your experiment, right? Get off a, what, what's really the, the biggest challenge I would argue with in innovation and so many of the big kind of organizations that are uh, where stability is important. NASA is one of them, by the way, you know, so, so actually it's very easy to come from a university to NASA because like you recognize you just have to relabel things and it's, it's kind of the same kind of psychology, but, but it's, it's that you, get people to think, you know, let's get started with something and you never play through the experiment because you get up when push comes to shove, it's like, okay, because you worry about that one change and you make a compromise before you even tried it. Right. And so basically you crump compromise the experiment out of existence. And so for me, for me, um, as a leader, what I try very hard is to create innovation platforms in which we're just trying things. And we're communicating to all stakeholders that we're trying things and it may fail. And frankly, that means that I go to a congressional hearing and say, we may fail 50% of the times. You should just know that's what we're doing. Let me tell you though why we're doing it. And I think for me in academia, it takes leaders uh, uh, to do the same, right? Kind of, if you're kind of from the bottom up, kind of the, the, the methodology must be different, right? Kind of because you, you, you don't have that shelter necessarily. And for me, in a case like that, I've run that also. And the way I've done it there is really created kind of a, a pretty visible, but kind of, I tried to isolate it from the other pieces, but kind of by perhaps naming it something different, by taking it out of the regular curriculum and to create an unquestioned success with different rules and then drive it in the other way, right? So it's, it's all, you know, uh, you know, the founder of Twitter once told me, it's like, you know, the future is already here. It just hasn't scaled yet, right? So, so you basically create the future and then scale it as a second step. Don't, don't try to do it all at once. That's very hard if you drive from the bottom up. So, so that kind of one is a top-down strategy. The other one is a bottom-up strategy. Both can work, but none of them is easy. Nobody says that. Susan, I'm really interested in your opinion. Uh, so, you know, Spoonie put in the chat, right? We value what we can measure. We don't measure what we value. So I'm not ready to throw out measurement. We got to get better <coughs> at measuring. So there's um, indicators of successful STEM education report that came out of the academies. It was a response to the college scorecard that was released um, under Ted Mitchell's leadership saying just because it's hard doesn't mean you should do it and there's some ways that are in and it to weighs in and it totally values qualitative research that's been in the thread and you know as scientists we got to get to know social sciences my research partner is a sociologist and i am so grateful for her expertise and she really appreciates mine we <coughs> we have undervalued inter and interpersonal skills because they've been hard to measure. Again, the report supporting student success in STEM is really all about what can we assess, what do we need to do to get better at assessing. 
on a college campus, we have multiple ways in, right? One is to take advantage of regional accreditation. It's on a 10 year cycle. Every part of the country has a different regional accreditor, but they are all pushing learning outcomes. And you know, you've got a way forward. It's gotta be top down and bottom up, right? It's gotta be something that the faculty will buy into, they can develop, they can support that they can use, but rather than saying, we know what we're doing and it's just, you, you can't measure this because this is you know, just so complex, challenge people to you know, pull from the literature, not to just pull something out of their back pocket, but that's a really good way forward. I think the other piece, and this has been in the chat, right, is what is the currency of the realm at your institution? Faculty are smart and they like their jobs and they'd like to keep their jobs. So they look, what do I need to do to keep my job? And then you get tenure and it's like, yeah, it'd be nice to be a full professor. And there's a little bit of promotion bump in salary. We don't necessarily make as much. So yeah, I kind of like to do that. What I'm so optimistic about now, and I would steer you to a website called TEVAL, T-E-V-A-L.net. It's um, a teaching evaluation project that NSF has funded that has just taken off with research ones, different kinds of universities. AAU has helped sponsor some things jointly with the National Academies. There is standing room only when they present at um, AAC and U conferences. And there are rubrics there, again, just to get some ideas, but the idea is to push towards a much more holistic evaluation of teaching with multiple voices, not just the student evaluations, which we show over and over have incredible implicit bias against women and racial and ethnic groups. And if you're an older woman and you're an older woman of a non-white background, you're really in big trouble in terms of implicit bias. So looking at other um, ways to do that, that's really helpful. And listening at these different sessions I've gone to, at institutions, you know, you thought, ah, oh, they never get there. They're starting to shift. And the way they've been doing that is working at the departmental level, getting department conversations about how to weight the different pieces of information about teaching and what's gonna be useful and align with the discipline. We're actually trying it with the Associated Colleges of the South. And we start it, you know, the chief academic officers meet all the time and, you know, yeah, I was the troublemaker that said, what about doing this? And people got interested. But we could, he said, hey, it's not gonna work if we come up with something, let's figure out how we gather the insight on our campuses, how we can bring folks together and we learn together and we build resources and tools. What do people need to go forward? So think about the structures that are out there that you can riff off of. Think about how you get leadership within departments and other places to come to you know, national convenings. The virtual world right now is great because you can attend a whole lot more um, for a lot less than you usually could. And when people see others are doing it, right, get a little bit of jonesing going there. You know, if the AAU schools are doing it, you know, maybe at my you know regional comprehensive, you know, maybe that'd be okay to do. So I think there's a lot of infrastructure opportunities out there to leverage and build a coalition of the willing, you know, get a subgroup going within your department for the biologists, take advantage of the partnership and undergraduate life science fellows because they have, they'll come and work with your department, right? None of us is never an expert at our own department, the lighthouse effect or never a profit in your own land. But there are a lot of ways to move it forward if you don't go it alone. Just don't ever go it alone. I tried that 35 years ago and I didn't get any place. <laughs> Thank Can you. I just talk about one more strategy that, that I personally use that I just really believe in and that is actually to put the student in the center mm -hmm. and also have the student be the advocate. I, I have won academic battles on that strategy alone that nobody believed are winnable because if you 
if the students, ultimately it's about the students and frankly, it's not a, it's so much a power play. It's gonna, frankly, what I learned is that, and I believe that deeply, even some of the most traditional faculty, you really don't wanna move off what they have done. If they see it in the students, they will get it. You know, if they see the positive impact and they really recognize that this is positive for the students, they will come on board. I mean, I could tell you anecdote after anecdote, you know, the professor called me up, it's like, look, I know you've do, done this. I have not been supportive because I think you're taking away from it. I now see what's happening because they're sitting in my classroom and it's incredible. I need to learn more. How do I learn more? Right, wow. so for me, of course that takes two years of resilience to get to that phone call. Uh, but, but the point is the students was, I mean, what, what I decided to do in these things, this was for an entrepreneurship program, which frankly was just a camouflage for saying, ill-defined experiences of that matter to you so you learn how to fail and actually build teams to do meaningful experiments, you know, utilizing the capabilities you have. I mean, that's, that's literally uh, what I think Kind of, uh, you know, at the core of the entrepreneurship experience is that kind of push, whether it's social entrepreneurship, a business, or, you know, a non-for-profit. And who, I mean, it's doing something meaningful that's super hard. You're almost certainly going to fail, right? So for me, uh, you know, using that uh, basically allowed alums to self-select in, but most importantly, the students. And Thomas, you can sell that to an administrator that maybe isn't so committed and especially right now, right, when there's financial issues for most institutions, we're tuition driven um, and most comprehensive regionals. And it comes down to retention, right? We're gonna hit a demographic cliff in 2025. There's just fewer 18 year olds. We can't go out and manufacture more 18 year olds because we suddenly need them and the demographics are different. So when you get the students, the best way to keep your, bell, your budget balanced is to retain those students. And we know from the research that the strategies you're laying out are the best ways to help your students say, stay, succeed in science or engineering and graduate in a reasonable length of time. So it, it's, it, you know, for the hard hearted, putting the student at the center, it makes good business sense. Well, I have to tell you both, I'm incredibly encouraged by you two agitators because I think the way you, your lens on the educational process and how that maps over to the, to the workplace is, is I, I think, perfect. And I can tell you from the, from the chat space, you have a lot of people nodding their, their collective heads. Um, uh, I think, Thomas, you may have said it earlier, uh, it's not going to be easy. Right, uh, and Tom and uh, Susan, from from your perspective, I'm sure you feel like you're you're pushing the wet noodle up up the hill sometimes. But this has just been a fascinating conversation. I think you've given us some really good ideas that our teams now can take as they begin to to map out maybe some uh, revolutionary ideas about how to create these curriculum maps that do a better job, Susan, to your point earlier about the integrating of the elements of, of getting the, the broader skill sets integrated into STEM education. So um, I, I know I speak for the group when I say thank you so much for your time and your energy and your, and your thoughts. Uh, and I know you're both about inspiration, so I will I will thank you for your inspiration as well, because uh, I think you've launched us into a into a great place for our for our next work, which I'm going to transition to Ariel and Punya if that's okay, and uh, maybe share a little bit about what's coming up next. Uh, Ariel, do you mind if I just yes, sir, before, uh, Ariel, no, are you good with, if I just uh, really I just wanted to say something you know I have not really addressed the team, but. I just wanted to thank each and every one of the team members who are working on this for their time and their effort. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe it matters and it's absolutely essential that you do it. And I just really wanna thank you. And yes, there is hope. And yes, I believe uh, it is possible to kind of break through some of those boundaries that have in front of us. And I've experienced it personally. Just wanted to acknowledge uh, how hard that is and uh, how uh, I'm deeply hopeful and and so glad that I was able to spend time with you here today. Sorry, Ariel. No, thank you. Thank you. I, you don't have to apologize for 
such a gracious thanks to the team. It, it, it's an awesome team. So, so thank, on behalf of the whole team, thank you very much, both of you, for, for contributing. Um, Susan actually introduced something that I think might be useful, a great segue to talking a little practically about the design workshop. Um, you mentioned, Susan, that uh, you know, it makes good business sense for university administrators to start thinking about being student-centered. Mm -hmm. And it occurs to me that especially in the, in the era that we're in with so many institutions now moving online and trying to figure out, okay, so what's the value add of the in-person experience versus the online experience? That student-centered component, while you can do things online, it's still, I think, far easier and, and more powerful to do some of these sort of student-centered activities and programs in person. And so really administrators might want to start thinking about raising the bar, raising the game of what we do with our in-person experiences with, with that in mind. So maybe that's actually the right moment for us to be doing the kind of design work that we're embarking on doing from a very practical and pragmatic sense. And in um, an inclusive way, right, this twin pandemic, yeah. the yep. systemic racial injustice right. and, and COVID. And it, it, you know, it's horrible. I mentioned I'm working on COVID across campus, but it's an opportunity, right? So look at the right. silver lining and right. run with it. Right. It's creating a, an, an opening, I think, for um, at the administrative level for ideas of the sorts that this workshop can be bringing forward. So let me just say a few words about the workshop here, folks. Um, so we're going to be pivoting after today to the design workshop. Uh, the real meat of that is going to be the week after next. Uh, and thank you in advance, everybody, for committing your time to that. It's, it's going to be intensive, but it's going to be very productive. But it's going to begin with a, a day zero event tomorrow, uh, just an hour and a half. Uh, we ask if you can to please come for an hour and a half, not just an hour 15. We have so much to do, we couldn't quite cram it into an hour 15. If you can't, that's okay. But we do need you to be there. There will be a new URL. Um, it will not be the same URL as these webinars. It will not be the webinar format. It'll be more the traditional Zoom room format, even though we have 100 or so people, we'll, we'll manage. Um, but we want to see your faces if you're willing to, willing to be seen and be a little bit more interactive, um, a lot more interactive, actually. Um, the Day Zero event is an opportunity for you to get to know your teams a little bit uh, and a word on teams in a minute. Um, and also, just as important, frankly, to become familiar in a logistical way with the web platform on which we're going to be doing a lot of the work. Um, uh, it's a platform that, that the CERC organization that you'll hear a lot more about if you aren't familiar with them uh, has developed for this kind of design work so that we actually are are doing our brainstorming and our, our outputting in a system that will immediately put uh, allow that information to be shared out uh, via the web in a very efficient way. Um, there will be two additional optional sessions next week, optional, um, but the uh, sessions uh, for a Q&A about what we're doing and what we're about, logistical questions and concerns, um, uh, and an opportunity again to get more hands-on so information about those optional sessions will also be in the email you'll get later today that will include the new URL for tomorrow. Finally, just a word about Teams. Um, I sent around an email yesterday about this, but I want to amplify it. It's, you know, it's not exactly in person as a webinar, but as best as I can here. Um, so most applicants came in as part of preform teams of three or more, but we had a few two-person teams that were a little worried are below critical mass. And we had about 20 or so come in as individuals who you had compelling reasons to be involved and we wanted to find a way to involve you. But the work is gonna be fundamentally team-based. So, so we've created some new teams um, out of the individuals plus the, some of the two-person teams uh, to, try to, get, uh, to try to get everybody into a team of at least three. That's not true in every case, but in most cases. And as a result, we did some provisional assigning um, of, of individuals to teams based on what we could glean from the homework assignment that we asked you to do and from your applications. Um, inevitably, these assignments are not perfect. Um, they may be fatally flawed in some cases. They may be brilliant in others. We won't know until you really get into those teams and start talking. We think they're all at least okay. Um, so uh, happy to answer questions. If you want to email me, I've already done a little bit of that. Please give it a try on Thursday. Um, see how it goes with those teams. If you're, if you're put onto a team that you didn't apply with, uh, we have a week to reshuffle things if things aren't quite right. So, so just be relaxed and casual about it come to me or Punya if you have questions or concerns as the process unfolds um, and we'll make it all work out well. Um, Punya, did you have any comments you wanted to, to share on this? Uh, no, I mean, just want to thank Susan and Thomas and all our previous guests, I think to set up <clears throat> what I, I, I'm anticipating to be sort of amazing series of projects and really appreciative of all the people who have participated and I couldn't be excited more um, to dive into this work and you know provide the space i think that's i think all we are really doing is bringing a group of like-minded people together 
um, and then providing a space for you to be innovative and creative. And I am thrilled and excited to be part of that uh, conversation and process. So looking forward to tomorrow. All right. Great. On that note, look for your email with the proper URL. Please carve out the time to join us. And again, our uh, gracious thanks to Susan and Thomas for joining us. It, it's been marvelous. And thank you, maybe mostly to our participants for hanging in there with us and being so engaged in the chats and the Q&A. You, you folks are amazing and we know some wonderful things are going to come out of this work. So uh, peace, stay safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Thank you.